Hi there, me, your friendly neighborhood humble stroke assaulter. Look, Dad, comb the hair, okay? So don't text me or call me to say you need to comb your hair because look, Dad, I comb my hair. That could become a thing now. Thanks, Dad. <clears throat> oh, by the way, Dad, you're only going to know if I combed my hair if you look at the screen with your left eye. Remember, you're blind in your right eye. So take your left eye, look at the screen, moving on. So I'm going to do a video today I've been meaning to do for a while. I've hinted at it. Um, I still have yet to become comfortable with editing, um, and that's just a byproduct of the stroke. So today's episode is going to be a long one. Bear with me. It's going to be called either Bullshit Aloma or Q is for Quackery. I did one kind of similar calling out Mundane Matt, and I don't mean this to be a response channel or a debunking channel, uh, kind of like uh, Miles Power or uh, Jeff Holiday. Um, you know, I don't mean it to be coming that, but I've seen a series of videos that I have ridiculous amount of umbrage with for various reasons, and we'll get into that. So I'm officially going to say that um, Thomas and Johnny from Extreme Games, Extreme Games, you're fucking liars. Oh, by the way, get kids out of the room. <clears throat> um, so there's these two YouTubers by the name of Extreme Games who have... Uh, not produced a video for about a month, at least, because I've been on their channel and I looked for their last video, and their last video was a month. And they did two or three videos to say, oh, look, we're dying, we're dying. Well, they live in Australia, where they get free health care, government-sponsored health care. They decided to get on an aircraft, fly to California. What's that? $5,000 each? Um, $2,000 each? Um, to fly to California to visit a chiropractor, and he's magically got the cure for him. Uh, chiropractor's name is John Bergman, and he is also full of shit. And I'm going to go through uh, my rationale for this. So, some things were said during these successive videos that are just wrong. Like, things don't work that way. Your body does not work that way. Now, like I did with Mundane Matt, because because of my stroke, learning new tasks on my own can be difficult. I'm not going to include any video footage. So you're going to have to find a way, other than using a DMCA, to community guideline this. And you're not going to be able to. There's no, nothing in here will be stolen or, or misappropriated or from another source. I will leave all the links to the articles I'm going to reference or have used uh, in the description down below, um, and I feel confident in saying that Johnny and Thomas, you're lying little fucks, and Bergman's a quack. Moving on. So, first off, you made this series of videos of, oh, oh, Johnny's dying, oh, he has weeks to live. Okay, so you live in a first world country with government-sponsored and paid-for healthcare, meaning Worst case scenario, you go to your general practitioner, you get a referral, you go see a specialist. And it costs you time, maybe cab fare, maybe bus fare, a coffee while you're waiting. I've been there a lot. So you decide to go to another country to pay whatever you're going to pay out of your own pocket for the aircraft there and back, for your food, for your accommodations, and then for the treatments. And he wanted you to have 60 treatments and you're going to do three a day. Well, that means, you know, you were in California for how many days? Did you do three a day every day in a row or did you take a break? So I'm going to call bullshit. Now, chiropractic medicine started in 1895. By a guy by the name of Daniel De Palmer, um, a grocer, yeah, he sold you your fruit and veg. Uh, with an intense interest in metaphysics, and prior to his discovery, he created this. It's not like something from the Greeks or the Romans or the Chinese or the Japanese or the Vikings, right? Um, he discovered you know, that he was also a magnetic healer. He had interests in phrenology. Yeah, the bumps on your head that might determine if you're a criminal um, or diagnosing disease. He was also a spiritualism. 
Um, he allegedly discovered bending and twisting and contorting the spine and manipulating the limbs will cure a deaf or partially deaf janitor. Well, I'm going to call fucking bullshit. A disease that you had subluxa subluxated bones, which 95% of the time are your spinal cord. So you've got subluxation. It's almost always the spine. Imagine that. Um, and if you manipulate the spine, you can get rid of these problems. So he believed that There's ancient belief, um, there's an innate intelligence, a higher power, if you will. Uh, he claimed that flowed from the brain through the rest of the body, down through the spinal cord, out through the nerves, the capillaries, and whatnot. Um, and all disease is a disruption of this innate intelligence, your soul. Right? Um, and so liver disease caused by subluxation. So for some reason your liver is misfiring, and by pressing on your spine, we're going to fix that. Well... Let's just consider how connected your spine to your liver you actually are. For those in the crowd that answered you're not, <clears throat> yeah, you're right, you're not. There's, there's no physical connection between your spine and your liver. Right? They're not directly connected. And in fact, your liver and your spine don't interrelate except on a non-anomic level. Right? Your liver just does what it does. And it's not like you directly can tell your liver, work harder. It doesn't work that way. Your brain sends a signal through the spinal cord and all the other nerves to go, yeah, hey, brain, do this. So, yeah, no. And despite the fact that standard, scientifically regulated, using the scientific theories and models of how to define evidence and determine theories and, and create rational arguments, Science has not yet once, in one legitimate instance, to prove any of this works. Right? Any of it. Now, a chiropractor gets about five years worth of training. A doctor gets significantly more than that. Right? Now, the first thing they make mention to is... I don't mean to slam them for the religiosity, but, oh, we have Jesus Christ on our side. Well, if you're honestly that sick, one of two things are going on. Either one, God hates you and you're being punished. Or two, it's God's plan. Right? It's either God's plan, you get that sick, or you've been a horrible Christian and you need to be punished. Either way, it goes back to God's plan. So, suck it up. If you get better, God's plan. If you die, God's plan. Problem solved. Moving on. Now, Mr. Bergman, and I'm never going to refer to him as a doctor because he's not a doctor. He's a mister, right? Mr. Bergman came on this like, must have been birth trauma. Could have been birth trauma. Okay, these guys are in their probably 20s. Them being birth was a long time ago. So birth trauma has no relevance on this, right? There's... There's no relevance for them being traumatized during birth. Now, you have chiropractors that use these scare tactics that 80% of newborns need spinal adjustments to treat the trauma of birth. Right? That due to the fact that they've had to travel out the birth canal, right, and there's all that squeezing and motion, and then the popping out of, and the machine that goes ping, ping, right? that things get misaligned and there's nerve interference. Fun fact, babies are squishy. In fact, the baby's bones remain in a semi-squishy state till about 20 to 28 months, depending on the child. So babies are bendy and squishy and they're bouncy because they're supposed to be bendy, squishy, and bouncy. Right? And, but because of these misaligned cervical problems and, and, and birth trauma and, and nerve interference, we need to snap and adjust these babies. No. Right? Um, right? And, and you're going to get people that are going to claim that children that are adjusted have superior health care. 
and that these adjustments can fix things like colic, constipation, ear infection, digestive disorders, hyperactivity, and bedwetting. How is me bending your spine going to stop you from wetting the bed at Odark Stupid? It's not. How is me bending your spine going to slow your kid down because they're hyperactive? Well, one, you might want to stop feeding them sugar cookies before bed. Two, it could be a dietary issue. Or three, they're a hyper kid because they're having a fun time. Um, digestive orders, again, your spine and your brain, they're not physically connected. Um, ear infections, no, sorry. Kids are messy and kids are dirty. They put their fingers on everything and then they go every... Ah. Colic? Yeah, you got a burpee baby. Right? Um, in fact, the American Academy of Pediatrics has warned that children may be at risk of very serious complications of spinal manipulation. A two, 2007 study led the University of Alberta research who reviewed 13 published studies and found 14 injuries to children who received chiropractic treatments. Nine of them were serious, two of them were fatal, one child died of a brain hemorrhage. And the other after a suspected neck, neck fracture. Ten of the injuries were directly attributable to chiropractic care. Right? And then, what's even better, is the Canadian Pediatric Society determined that some chiropractors will treat a serious problem instead of the child going to a real doctor. Um, and in some cases, this doctor will say that, oh, you know, it's not meningitis. Well, guess what? It was. And your kid dead. Your kid is going to die. Because you went to some naturopath, homeopathic, chiropractic quack who has no clue what they're talking about. They don't have the skills and ability to diagnose the significant issues of life, your kid has meningitis, and guess what? You went, oh, we'll just crack their back. No, they're dead. And you know what? If that was you, you killed your kid. Don't care. You're a horrible human. The next thing I take umbrage with is pro proprioception. So, Mr. Bergman made a big deal about proprioception. Why do I have umbrage with this? I have proprioception. I had a stroke. I had a stroke. My balance is shot some days. Um, so if you're going to try to convince me, and I'm going to consider myself an expert on proprioception because I have an issue with proprioception. Now, what is proprioception? Proprioception is basically the ability to sense stimuli arising within the body regarding position, motion, and equilibrium. Even if a person is in a blindfold, he or she knows through proprioception if an arm is above your head, or hanging by the side of the body. The sense of proprioception is disturbed in many neurological disorders. Let me just get this right. In many neurological disorders, right? It sometimes can be improved through use of sensory integration therapy and specialized occupational therapy in addition to physiotherapy. You cannot change proprioception with a neck manipulation, a spinal manipulation, or skull pressure. You need specialized routines given to you by a physiotherapist and an occupational therapist, exercises of practice at home, and regular testing. I did three and a half months of physiotherapy with a wonderful lady called Nancy. Well, not called, named. Um, a wonderful lady by the name of Nancy. I did three months, three and a half months with her. I spent two to three times a week on a wobble board. She blindfolded me. She would have me do um, like medicine ball exercises, play badminton, right? You're not going to fix a proprioception issue by twisting a neck or pressing on their spine or touching their head. That is complete farcery. It's quackery. It's bullshit aloma. It doesn't exist. And, and for Mr. Bergman to assert <clears throat> that proprioception, which is how the brain takes in stimuli, from all the senses, be it your taste, well, not so much taste, but your touch, your balance, um, you know, when you close, when I close my eyes on a wobble board, I'm good for 15 seconds, maybe, maybe 30 tops. Um, if I stand on a wobble board, it took me months to be able to do two minutes on a wobble board without about to find the floor really quickly and cause Nancy to write out paperwork. Luckily, never had to make her write out paperwork. <clears throat> so you're not going to convince me 
that by spinal or neck contortions um, are in some kind of modern Spanish Inquisition accoutrements, you're going to fix proprioception. You're not going to fix proprioception by having someone lie down and you push on them. No, proprioception is only, only going to be, and I'm not going to use the word repaired, because um, that's not the right word. Proprioception can only be addressed um, and 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 given a resolution. Now, how how uh, drastic will that outcome be? That all depends on the individual and why they have the proprioception and, and deficits they have physically, and there's so many issues involved. Um, you're gonna you're gonna work on proprioception by things such as climbing up and down stairs. I did that constantly with Nancy. You're gonna fix proprioception by various walking activities and routines. You're gonna fix proprioception by the wobble board. You're gonna fix proprioception by by routines and activities and exercises given to you by an occupational therapist and a uh, physiotherapist because you were sent there because a neurologist said y'all got an issue well my issue was i had a stroke so i take umbrage to the whole proprioception thing again bullshit aloma q is for quackery right not sure which one we're gonna go with now we're gonna talk about leaky gut not a thing your gut doesn't leak There's no such thing as leaky gut. That's, that's again, bullshit aloma. Right? So, leaky gut is when bacteria and toxins enter the bloodstream um, and can cause widespread inflammation and possibly trigger a reaction from the immune system. Supposed symptoms of leaky gut include bloating, food sensitivities, fatigue, Digestive issues and skin problems. Well, if you're bloating, maybe it's the food you're eating. Maybe you have a food allergy. Maybe you're celiac. Maybe you don't like yellow dye number five. If you had food sensitivities, let's go back to maybe you have a food allergy. Maybe you're celiac. Maybe you don't like yellow dye number five. Maybe you shouldn't eat beans. You know, um, maybe you should go see a gastroenterologist or a thoracic surgeon. Um, if you have skin problems, you might want to see a dermatologist or or maybe um, a doctor that specializes in um, allergies, like an actual real doctor, not one of those naturopath fuckeries, right? However, leaky gut is not a recognized medical diagnosis. For those in the back that missed it, let me just say this. Leaky gut is not a recognized medical diagnosis. <clears throat> um, in fact, proponents, so people that agree that leaky gut's a thing, Say it causes all kinds of conditions like chronic fatigue syndrome, migraines, multiple sclerosis, fibromyaloma, food sensitivities, thyroid problems, mood swings, skin conditions, and autism. Okay, let's just consider this. You have a gut. We'll call that your stomach and your intestines. How are they connected to your brain? How are they going to cause a migraine? They're not. Right? Um... Chronic fatigue, you know what? If you have a shitty diet and you're on a healthy uh, diet of hamburgers and, and Doritos and other junk, yeah, I'm going to say that could possibly cause chronic fatigue. But it's not your gut causing it. It's the crap you're putting down your neck. Uh, multiple sclerosis and fibro, please. I'm not even going to dignify that with a response. Um, food sensitivities. I'm going to say if you have a food sensitivity, maybe that's causing your stomach issue. Mood swings. So you're going to try to blame your stomach causing depression, bipolar, and anxiety disorders. I, I, I don't know what to say to that. Um, and then we're going to go to the last one, autism. Again, if you are going to try to blame the fact that you have a stomach condition, how is that causing autism? Let's, let's let, that, let that one just, going to let it land, right? Just going to let that one land. You have a stomach and an intestine 
and you got bloating and maybe a bit of the gas, you know, you can, you know, stink out a room. How is that going to cause autism? It's not. That's insulting. Right? Now, there may be instances where you have a leaky gut. That also might be called an ulcer. Shall we just consider that for a second? Maybe the fact you've actually got like a hole in your stomach and you have an ulcer. Yeah, that's that's another issue. Um, now, you may have an intestinal disorder, right? Uh, where um, intestinal juices, bile, fecal matter may be getting out from where it's supposed to be. But that's because you have a tear um, in the stomach, stomach lining, the junction between the stomach and lower, upper, or smaller intestines, the, the junction between the intestinal tracts and, and the colon, right, somewhere in there. So, but again, that's not leaky gut. That's something totally different. And that's something that requires surgical intervention. And again, manipulating um, the spine, manipulating the, the, the brain, which you can't do through the skull because it's kind of hard. Um, don't do that, you idiot. Um, so again, it's just bullshit aloma. It's quackery. Now, he shows us a couple of x-rays where there's large amounts of stomach gases, right? Sure. Okay. I'll buy into that. If there was that much stomach gas in the abdominal cavity, that's going to be a medical slash surgical emergency. And why isn't he doing his due diligence and calling 911 and fetching an ambulance? Right? What blood tests were done? How are you going to know they have all these magical issues um, with their guts without doing blood tests? Right? Without doing a barium drink x-ray. Now, in 2015, I had to have surgery for a hiatal hernia, meaning my stomach was above my diaphragm. In fact, I had a 100% hiatal hernia when they went to do the surgery. Um, I was the first hernia of that type to present at the hospital where I had the surgery in 25, 30 years. Um, I've had more than my fair share of barium. It sucks. Um, unless you do a barium drink enema, you're not going to be able to isolate all the intestinal, um, digestive, gastrointestinal worky bits. Right. Again, worky bits is a medically approved term. Um, you know, so I, I'm just going to say, no, you have no idea what you're talking about. If there is that much ambient gas in the body in places where it shouldn't be, that's now a medical or surgical emergency. Like you need to be removing your patient, which I'm going to call victim, um, from your clutches and give them to a suitably qualified medical practitioner. Not only that, free gas is often difficult to identify on, on an abdominal x-ray. And therefore, any patient that has a su suspected perforation, so if the gut is truly leaky, there's a perforation. Perforation meaning hole, right? Um, you have to do both an erect and a supine um, x-ray. So you have to do one standing, one lying down, right? And as little as one milliliter of free interperineal air can be detected on an erect chest x-ray, right? Um, I'm going to say, again, you have no idea what you're talking about. You just see this black open space. And you're like, oh, that's gas. That's bad. I need to scare you now. Now, he keeps mentioning that there's chemical and, and there's physical and there's emotional stressors. Well, manipulating the body is not going to fix anything chemical. And if there truly is a chemical stressor on the body, you need to do a boatload of blood tests to determine if they have an actual toxin in the body, like heavy metals, um, arsenic, um, something that's actually cancerous, some, you know, something that's actually going to do them harm. Didn't see you do any blood tests. You didn't say you did any blood tests, so I'm going to assume you didn't do blood tests. If there's actually something emotionally stressing, you're not a psychiatrist, you're not a psychologist, you're not a social worker, you're not a psychometrist, you're a quack. Um, manipulating the body is not going to do anything for anyone's emotional state 
but they're going to report well. Oh, I feel so much better now. Yeah. It's bullshit alone. It's quackery. Now let's get on to the brainstem. You try to say that you have pressure on the brainstem by pushing. Uh, I take umbrage to that, and we'll get into that in just a second. You do not have the ability with your fingers to manipulate or palpitate certain parts of the body to determine if there's pressure there without specialized equipment. I'm sorry, your thumbs are not medically calibrated. You don't have like pressure sensing thumb mark five. So knowing a little bit about neurological exams, because I've had a bunch, because I had a thing called a stroke, um, you didn't do a neurological exam, right? Um, so you have no idea what is going on intracranially. Like, what is going on in there? You have no idea. You didn't do any pressure testing. You didn't do any neurological testing, right? The brain stem is found at the base of the brain, right? Um, 90, 85% of the brain kind of is up in here, right? But your brain stem is that small little spot back here that actually connects the brain to the spine, right? The brain stem is smaller, found at the base of the brain. It's the anatomical link between the spinal cord and the rest of the brain. It has some very specific functions. Oops, went right by my notes. I've actually got notes for this, kind of a script. I know it's different. Um, let me know in the comments down below what you think. <clears throat> the brain stem is smaller, found, found at the base of the brain, so bottom of the brain, top of the spine, right? It has very specific functions to vital areas of your existence, right? Um, it controls your body temperature. It controls your blood pressure. It controls your breathing. The brain stem is also responsible for uh, organizing and coordinating swallowing, coughing, sneezing, eyeball movement, and ma 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 maintaining consciousness. Sorry, the tapping is an aphasia thing, right? Um, I still have aphasia. Right. Fun, fun, fun fact. So when you have a stroke, one of the neurological assessments they do is you have to do a swallow test. I just realized how that sounded. Okay, moving on. <laughs> yeah, insert bad joke there. So they, they, they give you a cup of water and they give you a couple, they give you spoonfuls and they have you do, a, I, think, I think I did it do it 10 or 12 times. And then they make you drink like a quarter cup of water and a half cup of water and then a full cup of water. And I mean cup, like the styrofoam cups, not measured cup. Uh, just to see if you have any ability swallowing. Because the last thing they want to do is have you choke to death in the hospital on the stroke unit. Um, and so if you're having a brainstem problem, you're pretty much cooked. Right? It controls blood pressure and breathing. Blood pressure and breathing. If you don't breathe and you don't have good blood pressure, you're something known as dead. Right? So I'm going to include a couple of links of actual neurological assessments and what the assessment means when they do certain testing. He didn't do any testing for neurological assessment. He has no idea that there's pressure on the brain stem. And then if there was actual undue pressure on the brainstem, I think you might want to call 911 and not fuck with their neck. Quack. <clears throat> now let's get into um, how chiropractors kill people. Yeah, I said that. I'm going to say it again. How chiropractors kill people, also known as stroke and spinal manipulation and neck manipulation done by chiropractors. It's a thing. So, extensive research shows that spinal manipulation is the most commonly practiced chiropractic procedure, right? Because again, most of your problems are because your spine's fucked up. Um, it's been determined that this practice has limited therapeutic value, especially when compared with less costly alternative therapies. And there's evidence that chiropractic neck manipulation may damage the, art, the, the neck arteries and increased chance of strokes. So what happens is they manipulate your neck and there's a series of arteries that run down here and run down here. The problem is when they twist the neck, snap the neck, right? It stretches that artery 
in one of two directions, if not both. Now the problem is your arteries are kind of meant to stay in one space. And they're meant to be a certain size, both in diameter and length, right? Well, when you stretch that, you now create a pocket, right? Um, and there's damage. Well, what happens when you damage skin? You bleed. Well, the problem is when you bleed on the outside, you, you get a you get a bandage or a bandage or a plaster and you put it on and it clots. And it, it's good it clots because then you get a scab. The problem is when it clots inside here, that clot builds up and becomes a ping pong ball of death in your body, essentially. Eventually that clot will move for whatever reason. Um, will it move immediately? Maybe, maybe not. Will it move in a week? Maybe, maybe not. Will it sit there for a year? Maybe, maybe not. You literally have a hand grenade in your neck on an indeterminate timer. And when that clot moves, it's either going to go down through your heart and give you a heart attack, or it's going to go up through your neck and, and you're going to stroke out, right? And that's as simple as that gets. In 1999, a Canadian stroke consortium did a retrospective survey of arterial dissection in Canada over the previous several years with 15 centers reporting 63 cases. The stroke results are 70% were due to neck trauma, right? 70% of these strokes were due to neck trauma. 30% were spontaneous. And of the traumatic cases, 50% were caused by neck manipulation. Right. Um, in some cases, arteries on both sides of the neck were damaged. So you're not having, you know, a chance to have a stroke here, but you're having a chance to have a stroke here. You got double your fun. Right. You got a BOGO, a twofer. Right. A double double. No, sorry. That one doesn't work. Right. In 50 percent that occurred without manip manipulation, minor neck trauma included swinging a golf club. Are you playing Australian rules of golf? Like, like what are you doing? Like, like barbarian golf? Hulk smash! Um, vigorous drying after a shower? Okay. <laughs> Nothing to say there. Um, votes of bi violent coughing? Um, I, I, how, like, what are you getting your flash dance on after the shower? Right? Whatever. Um, violent coughing? Okay. 90% of the dissections occurred, so 90% of these, these strokes occurred within hours after the trauma. So it doesn't necessarily have to occur immediately in, in the chiropractor's office on the table right after they've touched you. Um, some occurred within hours and some were delayed for a few weeks and a couple were a month later. In 2004, in Canada at least, I can't speak for the states, I'm in Canada, this document I found was Canadian, the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons issued a warning to the Canadian public, meaning all 36 million people, right? so they intentionally scared 36 million people, um, and the warning was um, that neurologists warn against neck manipulation, the final conclusion was that endless non-scientific non claims are being used about neck manipulation. And because these neck manipulations have no basis in science, it's, it's buffoonery, quackery, snake oil salesmanship, um, you can stroke out. There have been deaths in Canada and the States. I'm going to include a couple links um, about an inquest where somebody died due to a stroke. Now, during the inquest, an expert said... One of every 100,000 Canadians a year suffers a stroke due to manip neck manipulation. One out of every 100,000. Well, there's like 36 million people that live in Canada. That's what, 370 strokes a year in my country alone, right? One, so I'm going to assume the states in Britain will be relatively similar statistics because we have relatively similar lifestyles. Um, quality of care and the same could probably be said for like France, Germany, you know, the, the Denmark, Finland, the major Western European nations. In Canada alone, there's going to be 370 people in 2018 and another 370 people in 2019. They're going to stroke out because they let a quack touch their neck. 
Yeah. Think about that. You're going to go and get adjusted. And then you're going to die. And if you're not going to die, you're in for a complete shit sandwich. So. That's, you know, and having had a stroke and having worked with brain injured clients as my last job in mental health and having seen my grandmother go through the throes of a very, very debilitating stroke. Um, yeah. Do you want to roll that dice? One out of every 100,000 people in Canada. That's 370 strokes, if I've done my sums correctly. They could be wrong, but I had a stroke, so what? Now, the next one, skull manipulation. I'm going to manipulate your skull, and it's going to make things get better. Again, bullshit aloma or quackery. So, skull manipulation. You've got the cranial sutures, where... The plates of the skull fit together, right? Now, your skull is fused between 24 to 28 months. It's stopped moving. But in that time, you got that little soft spot on your, on your baby's head, right? As the skull is forming, because it needs to be pliable to go out the birth canal. Oh, that way you can have birth trauma. For, forgot about that. Um, so you're going to, eventually over time, the skull is going to fuse, because it has to, um, the human skull consists of 22 bones. There's 22 bones in the human skull. Only one moves. It's called your mandible, the lower jaw. It's the only bone in your entire skull, a structure made out of 22 bones, that actually move. These don't move. And the only way they are going to move is with a baseball bat, or a hammer, or a golf club. Once the skull is fused, everything is firmly interlocked. It doesn't move. It's now trapped. However, you had someone come up with this concept of cranial manipulation. So in the 1930s, so in the 1890s, we created this bullshit called chiropractic medicine. And then in the 1830s, William G. Sutherland... Um, looked at a disarticulated skull, meaning a skull that was taken apart, and noticed that there's these sutures that were beveled like the gills of a fish, and he concluded that there's some type of articulation and mobility, right, for a respiratory system. Let's, let's just think this one through here. Because there's those sutures from when your skull is forming, from, you know, um, when you're forming in utero, then you're born and you have birth trauma, um, and then as you develop between age zero, day of birth, up until, say, 18, right? Well, really, it's the first 20 to 28 months that matter, right? At that, and now, there are people that may suffer from a congenital um, birth defect where their skulls may not fully form. That is, That has nothing to do with this. So that is a set, something I'm not even going to talk about, so don't worry about that. Um, he noticed that these these parts of the skull, they fit together and they look like gills. So if they look like gills, we must be fish heads. And if we must be fish heads, there must be a respiratory system involved. Let's just think what we know about modern medicine. Okay, now that we've all had that think, we all know that's bullshit. Great, moving on. Then in the 1970s, um, a John Upledger ran with this idea, inventing craniosacral therapy, or CST, which postulates rhythmic fluctuations of cere uh, cerebrospinal fluid, the mobility of the cranial bones, and dural membranes. Dural mem mean the, the... So the thinking there is the membrane that surrounds your brain and then your skull and the plates therein... Um, oh, sorry, Dad. The plates therein and then your spinal fluid... There is like kind of like a brain beat. <laughs> yep, sorry. Um, so your brain's beating, and right, and the involuntary motion of the sacrum. So you have a a sacrum that moves involuntarily, all, all on its own. Um, 
And if they palpitate the skull, they can sense these pulsations. So if I touch my head, I can feel the palpitations. I can feel the beats, right? Uh, transmitted to the skull. And then I can gently maneuver and move these bones around. Yeah, again, let's just all have a think. Let's let that land. So your brain, the lining of the brain between the brain and the skull, and the skull and your spinal fluid, they all kind of have this beat rhythm going on, kind of like a Cuban fusion jazz band. And when your doctor touches your head, they can just feel the rhythm. No. Things don't work that way. So, sacro, craniosacral therapy, you know, makes a couple of claims. One, the human brain makes rhythmic movements at a rate of 10 to 14 cycles per minute. Right? And it does this unrelated to breathing and heart rate. Small cranial pulsations can be felt with the fingertips. Interference with the normal flow of cerebral spinal fluid is a common cause of disease. And freeing these restrictions to allow the body to be returned to normal is accomplished by tapping the skull with the fingertips. And the tap is a solid attention getting non-painful blow to the side of the head. <laughs> no! Okay, so... I will give you the, if there's a problem with your spinal fluid, that might be an indicator of disease. So if you have some form of neurologic or, or, or um, spinal condition, uh, something actually medically legitimately diagnosable with testing that can be determined by examining your spinal fluid, yeah, that might be an issue. But there's no ebb tide flow between your spinal fluid, your brain, and your skull. Let's just think how those are actually interconnected. Now, for those of you that have come to the conclusion they're not, thank you, moving on. And in fact, the most comprehensive criticism of this whole craniosacral therapy was published in 1999 in British Columbia. So the government, the Office of Health Technology Assessment, concluded this theory is invalid and the practitioners cannot reliably measure what they claim, <clears throat> right? So craniosacral therapy is sometimes referred to as craniosacral therapy, a type of body work that relieves compression in the bones of the head, the sacrum, a triangular bone in the lower back and spinal column. <clears throat> this therapy is reported to be able to treat the following things. Headache and migraines. Okay, maybe I'll give you that one. Constipation. How is your pooper connected to your head? It's not. Right? Irritable bowel syndrome. Disturbed sleep. Uh, insomnia. And I'll be right back. i got to plug in my battery. Sorry about that. So, constipation. How is your brain connected to your pooper? It's not. It's, it's fucking not. Um, irritable bowel syndrome. Again, see constipation. Disturb sleep cycles. Scoliosis. How is the squeezing of your head affecting a congenital neurostructural muscular disorder, bending of the spine, scoliosis? It's not. Um, neck pain. No, it's going to cause it. Sinus infections, nope. Fibromyalgia, nope. Recurrent ear infections or colic in infants. Again, here we go back to that. I'm going to torture a baby. No. TMJ, no. Trauma recovery, including trauma from whiplash. It's 
going to cause it. Mood disorders, like anxiety or depression. Okay, let's just consider this. You suffer from a neurochemical disorder, because that's what that is, be, be it anxiety or depression, which probably requires being medicated, right? That's probably what it caught. That's probably what you, you need, right? So how is squeezing your head going to impact anxiety or depression? It's not. Um, having had depression historically and having a current case of extreme anxiety because of having had a stroke, fuck you. No. Mood disorders. And then difficult pregnancies. If I squeeze on your head, we're going to avoid the birth traumas. No, I'm sorry. It doesn't work that way. How is your uterus connected to your skull? It's not. And then, despite more than 50 years of investigation about CST, there remains a void in credible evidence supporting the ability of these techniques to alter the movement of cranial structures or improved patient-centered outcomes. The time is past due for advocates of CST to contribute well-designed studies evaluating the efficacy of these techniques to peer-reviewed literature. The challenge is clear. Prove it or move on. And they've been trying to prove it for 50 years and can't get it right yet. So let's just consider, because I'm on 45 minutes and this is probably the longest video I've ever done. Let's just consider a few things here. One, extreme games. Thomas and Johnny, you're horrible fucking humans. You simply created this situation of your dying to trigger likes and, 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 and people. If you're dying, are you giving away an iPhone? Dude, I almost died. Four and a half months ago, I legitimately almost died. Had a stroke. Could have been lethal. Not, oh, I could have had cancer. You know what? No. Oh, I could have had this. Dude, you could have got hit by a bus getting ready to go to the airport in Australia to go to California. Your airplane could have fell out of the sky as you're flying from Australia to California. You could have got hit by another bus leaving the airport to go to that quack's office and then reverse that cycle back to Australia. So don't give me that coulda, woulda, shoulda crap. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. No. You know, and then Mr. Bergman in your quackery Oh, the abnormal bowel gas on an x-ray. It could be toxic foods, could be vaccines, could be medication, could be compromised nerves. You're not a neurologist. You're not even a PhD that deals with neurology. You're a quack. How are you going to... And you didn't even do a neurological assessment. Out of everything we saw you do, you didn't do a neurological assessment. And you know what? Even if you did, you're not qualified or licensed to perform one. So, yeah, did you happen to do, like, any kind of neurological assessment? No, you did not. You're more worried about birth trauma and vaccines and all this other hocus-pocus, just garbage. Um, the leaky gut, not a thing. Um, your kidney issues, Johnny. If you legitimately had kidney issues, me or anyone else just pushing or poking at you would have had the same result eventually. So you legitimately weren't dying, right? You, you two are, um, you two are just basically birth control accidents. They're horrible birth control accidents. Right? You're, you're thieves of air, wastes of rations, and bags of skin that have learned to walk upright and talk. And those are possibly your redeeming qualities. Right? Um, if your kidney issues are so bad, Johnny, and I think I got your names right and I've confused them, I really don't care because it's not my problem. Um, if, if you were legitimately that sick, there's no way you would have been able to get traveler's insurance to leave Australia where you have free health care to fly to a country where you'd have to pay for service. You wouldn't have been able to get traveler's insurance. 
You know how I know that? I'm unable to get traveler's insurance. And I was planning to go to Las Vegas in January to go to the SHOT Show. I can't do it because I'm afraid of getting sick in America where I'm going to have to pay for my health care. Um, and, you know, Thomas, you have ear infections? Yeah, that's not going to be fixed by a chiropractor. You have vertigo? Again, not going to be fixed by a chiropractor. Balance control? Not going to be fixed by a chiropractor. Birth trauma? Dude, you're in your 20s. Fuck off. Um, antibiotic use? That's how you cure ear infections. Um, have you had any moles or wisdom teeth? How is having a mole removed or wisdom teeth taken out going to impact a leaky gut or a kidney or your proprioception? So... I'm going to land the plane because I'm on 49 minutes, and this is going to be the longest video I've done to date. Um, and again, I started my YouTube channel to help keep in touch with friends and family that don't have the opportunity to see me regularly. I also started my YouTube channel to um, help educate other stroke folk because I found there was a lack of information on some of the things I was experiencing after my stroke and some of the documentation I was given from the hospital or whatnot. So... This channel wasn't ever meant to be a response channel. And I'm not trying to emulate like a Jeff Holiday or a Miles Powers. That, that's not what I'm attempting to do. What I am attempting to do is, is point out bullshit aloma and quackery and do it with a combed head of hair so my dad doesn't complain now. Um, there you go, Dad. Remember, Dad, if you have to look at the screen, left eye only. He's blind in his right eye. He'll get that joke. Um, so, Mr. Bergman, you're a quack. You're a complete buffoon. Oh, and that Black & Decker butt plug thing you use? Yeah. Can you please show me what medical catalog you purchased that out of? That's all I got to say about that. Um, you kept mentioning about the chemical, physical, and emotional stressors on their bodies. Well, did you bother doing blood tests or refer them to blood tests? You know, and you're not a psychiatrist or psychologist or psychometrist or social worker or reg registered therapist. You're a quack, right? Um... So, and to try to say some of these things that could be related to vaccines or other things that might cause autism, that's just offensive. Just, just, just offensive, right? Um, and to Johnny and Thomas, right? Um, I don't wish you any ill. Um, I think the gene pool might be strengthened if you were no longer in it, but, you know, that's on you. I'm, I'm not going to say anything more about that. Um, but I think you're horrible humans that manipulated your viewership um, in the event that if we create this sense of urgency that, oh God, we might be dying, um, you know, we can increase viewership, get more views, get more clicks, get more likes. Oh, and at the same time, just, just give away an iPad. Well, I'm not giving anything away, right? Um, in fact, I don't think I'll ever be to the point where I can give anything away. But that being said, I'm going to land the plane right about now. So you've been watching my video right now for 51 minutes and 20 seconds. And if you've stuck in this long, thank you ever so much. Um, if you've stuck in this long and not enjoyed it, well, that's on you, not me. Um, now then, if you do happen to watch my channel and you are either a stroke assaulter yourself or you're one of the supporters of a stroke assaulter as they go through their journey post-stroke, please like, share, subscribe, comment down below. If you want to get in contact with me directly, you can email me at strokeassaulter at gmail.com. I say again, strokeassaulter at gmail.com. I've been meaning to make this video for a while. Unfortunately, I still don't have the, the mental acuity to learn how to edit. Um, so, this is a this was, with the exception of that pause break, th there's no edits to this, right? There's no DMCA material, so you're going to have to find a way to community guideline strike me, but you're not going to be able to because I've not said anything offensive or whatever on this this video. So, meh. Um, oh, by the way, don't care. I had a stroke. Um, and... If you happen to see either in yourself or someone around you, the signs or symptoms of a stroke, right? Someone that might look befuddled, right? They look confused. Uh, someone that's having vision problems. Um, someone that might be uh, having facial droop. You might not be able to smile equally effectively or at all. Uh, you might uh, not be able to raise both arms equally effective or at all. You might be having speech issues, slurred, stuttering speech, inappropriate word usage for situation or context, difficulty finding or selecting words, inability to stand, unaided, uh, general body weakness, weakness on one side. Uh, please immediately put, put that person in a position of comfort and dial 911. Something so simple can save a life.